So hello, uh, we are back at our Lebeg dominated convergence theorem, which I stated and stopped yesterday. So let's continue with this. So what is it saying? So by now we have already said what it means for a complex valued measurable function to be integrable. And now we want, so we've done all the algebraic uh, operations, you know, we can add and we can do scalar multiplications, we know how it behaves. So now we come to this thing about whether something like what I've written at the top of page two is going to be valid. Okay, and this indeed is one of the really often used theorems in analysis. We really, and this is uh, where if you remember your sum of your Riemann integrals, I am not going to say that you need it, but this would not be true for Riemann, okay? And this is one of the reasons why we, uh... hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. You, you, you. Oh. Right, so we have a sequence of complex measurable functions and explicitly we have just two assumptions. One, that the limit, the pointwise limit of this function sequence exists for every x in x, okay? For now we are starting with every x in x and mod f in x is less than gx. So two things we will be able to read off straight away from these two assumptions. But what we want to prove is that this implies that the limit function f is integrable, Lebesgue integrable, we defined that yesterday, and the limit of the inter Lebesgue integrals of fn's converges exactly to the integral of f, okay? so. This is obvious from B, zero. Somebody asked me, I think, whether G is a non-negative function. It is G measurable. That's implicit here. Moreover, because We are writing X. Yeah. And G is in L1, so this is going to be finite. Right? So what does this mean? Mod F M. Yeah. Who was saying it? Please go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, Fn is in L1. Yes. So we have done this. So this is also implicit in our conditions now. Okay. So then. If I define what can we say about this function in terms of negative, positive, uh, complex, what values will it take? What can you say about HL? Real value of the function. Only real valued? Ma'am, it takes non-negative values. Hmm? Uh, it takes non-negative values. Yes, because mod fn is less than or equal to g. What can I say about limits? This is going to be less than gx. 
for all x, which means so modulus is continuous, I can take it inside. Right? Therefore, mod fn minus f, which we can write as simple triangle inequality, Yes. So HN is a non-negative function. What else can we say? Is it going to be integral? Is it going to be measurable? Okay, so we can talk of the integral of HN. It may or may not be finite, but we can talk about integral makes sense. Okay, we, had, we know how to define this for uh, non-negative functions. Okay. So now let's use Fatu's lemma. No, Fatu's lemma is applicable for what kind of functions? Did you not use non-negative functions there? Okay, we apply Fatu's lemma to this HNs. So it says limb, limb inf of H ends d mu, the integral with respect to mu should be less than or equal to, I can pull out the limit Okay, is that right? That's about exactly the statement of Fatu's lemma. Now, if you look at the left-hand side of this inequality, what can we say about limit inf of HNs? What is HN? It is just 2G minus mod Fn minus F. So point-wise limit exists or not for HN? Yes, it exists. So what would this be? 2G. Exactly. So because this is true, this implies you have here x and simply 2g. And now I want to open up. I actually want to write what HN stands for. Right? And limit I keep as it is for now. And this is an integral, two functions. So I can write Right? Is that okay? Yes, Is this thing here. Okay, I'm not taking the minus sign out. Now we will use this property about limb inf and limb soups that you would have done even in your real analysis and it must have been refreshed when you looked at these things in the first part of this series. So what is limb inf minus, what should I get? 
minus limb sweep of the function. Yes, exactly. So, okay, there is no uh, n here, so I don't need to write this thing here. So this is just two g d mu x minus limb sup so the upshot is what do we have if you see we started with integral x 2g with respect to mu and that you are getting is less than equal to this this expression on the right hand side top of page 5 so this implies Okay. Now let us consider similarly, I will try and get something in terms of limb inf of this. So similarly, if we write GN to be um, and apply Fatou's lemma, what will you get? Can you quickly tell me? We'll get lim inf is less than or equal to zero. Okay, let me do some steps. Just let me write this and then we say pull it out. Again, the left hand side is just 2G because the limit And on the right hand side, you will simply get, so it will be limb inf of integral of 2g plus integral mod fn minus f. So it's just a positive non-negative thing. So there will be no change to limb. So and you will just simply get 2g d mu plus limb inf. Yeah, agreed. Can I go on, please? Yes, ma'am. Yes, and that means and now if you call these. Look at these two things. What do you get? The limb inf is always less than equal to the limb soup. And this is less than zero. So this implies limit exists and equals zero, right? Is that clear? So that takes care of us. assertion two here, okay? Ah, ah, I forgot to say something about F, but we did this here. 
let me call this something i don't know what we can call it um, three so the one number one is obvious from point three right mod fx is less than gx sorry i should have remembered i forgot to write this so mod f is also less than So this implies, can you, uh, sorry, uh, are you with me here? I forgot to write this. Okay. Three is okay? Yes, sir. So number one, we proved right now I've written. Two is done. And how will we conclude three? What am I going to use to prove three? some property that's why i want to spell it out though it's sort of trivial once you start working with these things what do we want to show fn d mu so this should go to zero right but here i so this is this is the Linearity we proved yesterday. So I'm using that. And then we said integral mod of the integral is less than equal to integral of the mod. So I'm using that here. And this goes to zero as in those two as shown. Therefore, Okay, so that takes care of our Lebesgue dominated convergence theorem, a very, very important tool in analysis. Okay, now I just want you to pay attention to the fact that in the statement, and also for all that you have done till now, we've always said for every X in capital X, all our functions we were thinking of as defined on all of X, this inequality B that I have written here is holding for all X and so on. It turns out that actually we can ask for a little less, okay? Maybe not for all of X, okay? And this depends on mu, of course. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. Sets of measure zero, okay? So it, Sets of measure zero, you understand. Huh? Mu of A is zero, then we call A a null set or set of measure zero. It turns out that for null sets, the integral over a null set doesn't matter. Okay, so now I'm going to make all this precise in a formal way, but please, uh, uh, if it's confusing you, please stop me and ask. Some of this you would know already. Okay, so let me define this notion of almost mu almost everywhere. So let P be any property, some property. which a point may or may not have. For example, we wrote in the Slabeck uh, dominated convergence theorem. Oops. What did we write here? Uh, the second condition was there is a function G such that mod Fn X is less than GX for every X belonging to X. So I could call this fnx less than gx as property p and then our assumption b is that p holds for every x in x okay 
so we could we could call any uh, p could be any property we want to look at so if mu is a measure on a sigma algebra m and e is a measurable set then the statement p holds almost everywhere on e means there exists a measurable set n and sitting inside e with measure of n zero and such that p holds for every point in e minus n okay so going over this again what we are saying is that p holds everywhere on e except on a set of measure zero okay and actually uh, so we have been talking about all this uh, the lebesgue dominated convergence theorem and there's a limit and everything we have taken to exist everywhere but we can write down a version for which it is almost everywhere or mu almost everywhere okay and of course this is always with respect to the measure so when it's it's clear that there is just this measure mu we sometimes drop it or we'll say mu almost everywhere so we can say p holds mu almost everywhere on e okay so this is this for example we could also this is an interesting one we can do um so let's look at an example and work out some things for it for f g measurable functions on x if measure of the set x what will we say what we'll say f is equal to g mu mu almost everywhere on x okay so here my property p is fx is equal to gx okay okay what about do you remember equivalence relation Okay, let's write it this way. So I'm saying this is this and let's write to denote this. So we are going to say F is related to G. If F is equal to G mu almost everywhere on X, which means FX is GX everywhere on X, except possibly on a set of measure zero. So outside a null set, fx and gx agree. 
Okay, so quickly, can we prove that this is an equivalence relation? Yes, ma'am. What would be very simple, easy to show? F is related to F because F is equal to F anyway at all points. Yeah. Yes. And then uh, F is equal to G almost everywhere on X. Then G is uh, related to F related to G implies G related to F. So reflexive. Symmetric. Symmetric are trivial. Yeah. Yes. Is it okay for everyone or you want me to spell this out? So the only thing which requires a little bit of work is transitive. How will we do this? Any idea? So suppose if related to G. If is related to G and G is related to So then I can say there exists Two sides measurable with measure of n zero and what is n equal to zero? N is which set? Um, a set of all x belongs to x such that f of x not equal to g of x. And m m, m is set of all x belongs to x such that g of x is not equal to h of x. And I forgot to write mu of m is also zero, right? Now, what we want to show is the set where x, so I want to consider this set. Okay. We want to show this set has measure zero. How will we do that? Simple observation that this set sits inside Is that true? I think it's easier to see it with the complements. You can check this, okay? Work with the complements of both sets. Then you see, you can show that N union M complement is sitting inside all x belonging to x such that fx is equal to hx. And then why is measure of n union m zero if measure of u, uh, measure of n is zero and measure of m is zero? Do you know how to prove this? Measure of n plus measure of m. Sorry? Measure of n plus measure of m. You mean this is equal to measure of n plus measure less of n? Yes, yeah, this is or equal, to, equal to. So this is zero. Plus zero plus zero. Yes. Equal. That's right. So so this that's right. So this becomes a equivalence relation. Okay. But more, okay, this is fine, but really what is really more important for us is this observation, which I'm just recording as a lemma. So this relation is as described earlier. Then for every E, What are we saying here? 
that if if the if f is equal to g almost everywhere then the integral of f and integral of g are going to be the same what is happening outside on a set of measure 0 will have no bearing on the integral on the value of the integral okay can you see this intuitively okay anyway let, let's prove it uh, rigorously then because this is this is quite this is really very important for us that uh, for set outside set of measure zero or rather sets of measure zero have no no contribution to make on a, on the Lebesgue integral that we define okay so let's prove this Dr. Red, okay. Let, let N be the set where F and G are going to be different. And we know that so you know that mu of N has to be zero. as f and g are and now for any e belonging to m we can write e as a That's true. Okay. Is that true? And this is a disjoint union. So, therefore, what can you say about measure of E? Intersection N. Okay, remember n is measurable and all that. Okay, so you write mu e intersection n. All right. So now, what can we do? We know f and g agree outside n. So I could write, if I have to write integral of e, sorry, integral of f on e, I could break e as Right? And because the measure of E intersection N is zero, this first integral on the right contributes zero. And you are left with but what happens to F and G on E minus N? If you take away the points of N from E because n is the set of all x's for which fx is gx you will simply get f and g agree on e minus n okay 
okay and again intersection of n and e has measure zero so it doesn't matter whether you have f or g there it's still going to be zero and this is okay so what have we done sets of measure zero are negligible in integration they don't contribute anything so if two functions are differing on sets of, on a set of measure zero the integral will be the will will all will be the same okay but now we come to this question now this is where because we are starting to talk about sets of measure zero do you think this is true so this is a question suppose e belongs to m, okay and mu e is zero and n is contained in e can we conclude what do you think yes ma'am yes yes there is a catch here see i have not said that n is so this is yes only if we know that n itself belongs to m from what i have written above this is not clear at all okay so uh, right now because we are still we haven't reached the point in this theory where we can uh, construct the lebesgue measure on r and all so i can't give you uh, good genuine examples but look at this simple uh, example here a sort of made up example but nonetheless so you take x to be any set really and i define m to be and i define mu So M is a sigma algebra, trivial sigma algebra. Okay, mu is a, a measure, but there can be. So this is a made-up example, and there'll be more example once you uh, we get to constructing a, a concrete measures, non-trivial measures. Okay, so you can pick up any set. N does does not belong to M. Okay, so this is sort of a trivial example, but but nonetheless, this can happen. Most most measures that you will work with, such pathologies will not happen, but this is possible, and this is this is bothersome, right? If you the whole idea of doing the measures is what to be able to, in some sense, gauge the Length or volume or some extent of a set. Hello. Yes. Hello. Here, x is means finite countable. What is this? X is just one, two, three, four. Okay, let me stop at ten. All these numbers. Okay. 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 Is that okay? Yes, ma'am. So. what was i saying <laughs> yes uh, so to have a set 
which is negligible, yet you have something smaller, which we can't measure, doesn't sort of make sense. So this is bothersome for us, for the theory. So there is a notion of complete measure. Okay. It turns out every measure on a measure space for which such a thing doesn't happen. You can extend the measure and find a slightly bigger uh, measure sigma algebra so that things work as we want to. You see, intuitively, as somebody said, if mu is zero and n is a subset of E, you want mu of n to be zero. So sets which satisfy this, we will call uh, measures which satisfy this are called complete measures. And it turns out a small step uh, ensures that uh, you can complete a measure. It's in some sense, like, you know, some kind of close completing a matrix space, very roughly speaking, not, not in a precise way at all, but so you do some kind of completion. Okay. So let, let us go ahead with that. So first I'll prove a formal theorem to show you that a completion for a measure is possible. And then we'll define formally what you mean by a complete measure space. Okay. So here's my theorem. So you have a measure space. So now I define this collection M star of subsets of X as all subsets of X such that there exists A, B, in M, please note, we are not saying E is in M. We are just saying a, E is any subset, but there are A and B in M such that and mu of So if we set mu bar of E to be mu of A, this extended, the, this collection M star, right now I'm not saying it's extended, is itself a sigma algebra Okay, so have a look at M, curly M star again. Can you immediately find a collection which is sitting in M star? Can you immediately see? M is itself in M star. The entire collection M is sitting in M star. Why is that? Because for so, any element uh, of M, we can take uh, the same a, set. A yes, and A and B to be the same set, E. So you pick up E in M, you take A and B to be E. So all of this is satisfied. So entire M sits inside M star, okay? So let's, what do I need to prove to show that M is a sigma algebra? 
So if M is contained in M star, therefore X belongs to M. So that condition is done. Now, what was the second one? Oof, why is this going on happening? Sorry, just let me. Second is, I'm just, pardon me for this. So second, so we show we show that if E belongs to M star, then so does E complement. Okay. That's the second condition. And the third one is about countable unions. So we'll come to that. Now, so if E belongs to M star, there exist A and B belonging to M. Look at the definition of M star such that A is contained in E is contained in B. And the measure of B minus A is zero. Okay. So because A is contained in E is contained in B, we will have, if I take just the complements, I have B complement is contained in, oh, sorry. And these two sets are of course in M. So the first condition is fine. Now I have to talk about mu of, we need to show it's zero. Now what is AC? What is this? A complement intersection. B? B complement complement B. Sorry? A complement intersection B. Which is a B minus A. Yeah. So this is fine. because of this condition here. So E complement is definitely sitting inside. And okay, so the last uh, for thing for this to be a, a sigma algebra is that the countable unions of subsets of sets in M should be in M, M star, sorry. So third, we sh uh, let um, EIs be in M star. We show that the union of EIs no. So for E, because each EI is in M star, I should write this is wrong. This is a set. Okay. So since each EI is an MI star, there exists AI, BI, Correct? Okay. So can you guess? Now I want to show union EIs to be in M star. So I have to union get hold of... Union so of AIs and union of BAs. Should be our sets which will sandwich union EIs. So that yeah. is pretty obvious because you want... Because of this condition here. And measure of union of BA. 
or difference union of a is zero that we need to prove okay uh, that, that is because uh, b a um, minus a is b a intersection a complement hmm and uh, union of b a difference uh, minus union of b a will be union of b a intersection uh, union of a a complement that is uh, okay can we write it because everybody else might uh, let me quickly write down so then this is clear then a and b belong to m because of the measure property um, measure sigma algebra properties of curly m and a is contained in b moreover b minus a i think this is what you were saying which is um, i can write as uh, simply okay now what's happened Yeah. And this should be contained in if you take out a smaller set. Okay, so each of these is contained, so the unions will be contained in this. Is that okay? And countable union of sets of measure zero have measure zero. Therefore, mu of B minus A which is less than mu of oh sorry is zero so e belongs to m star so we have established that m star is a Now there were two bits, so we have a sigma algebra and a mu bar, which we defined. Where is it? Here. So mu bar E is mu A. So we have to show mu bar is a measure. Now two things clear, if A is in M, then mu bar A is mu A, that is fine from here itself, because it's the same set sandwiching itself. So now, clearly, mu bar A should be mu a for all a in m okay now how are we defining mu bar so mu is mu bar well defined so for example what could happen is uh, And suppose there is A contained in E contained in B, as well as A, A1, B, B1, all are in M and mu of so in such a situation, it's not immediately clear that 
because if you look at the first uh, containment, then mu of e sh mu bar of e should be mu a. You look at the second containment, mu bar of e should be mu a one. Okay, so immediately it's not clear, but just a little bit of work will show us that this is well defined. Okay, how much time do we have left? Uh, three more minutes. Okay, so I hope we can do this. Uh, and whatever remains, maybe we can take as homework for tomorrow or oh, not tomorrow, Monday. So we have, so assume that we have this A and A ones. So So this containment is not difficult to see. Okay, and we can write A as right, and this is a disjoint union. So this is union, this union is disjoint. Therefore, mu of A will be, so sum of these two, so this is just the additive property of the measure. And this is mu A intersection A1. Okay, if we started with a and A1 in these rules, so roles. So similarly, mu of A1 will be mu of A1 intersection. If we interchange the role of A and A1. Okay. All right. I will start stop here and we'll continue with the rest of the proof tomorrow. Thank you.